You may have heard people at Netscope talking about the cloud-enabled kill chain when we talk about cloud threats. This could be the attack matrix steps, or it could be the more traditional kill chain steps. Either way, each of these steps can be prevented in many cases by controls provided by Netscope. And in this demonstration, I just wanted to show you an example of an insider threat, a malicious insider acting on Salesforce and how Netscope can help prevent that attack from being successful. So on this machine, I'm going to play the role of the malicious insider. I have access to a Salesforce instance because I am an employee, but my access is very limited. I can't actually see any of the accounts or opportunities that my company has in Salesforce. I basically just have access to the chatter facility for communicating with other people within the organization through Salesforce. I'm going to need to escalate my permissions. I'm going to need to gain access to a different user's account in order to access sensitive data that I want to take with me, perhaps when I leave the company. And I've identified Eve as a senior member of our organization whose account would be appropriate for me to gain unauthorized access to and steal data from. So the first thing I'm going to do is I know a little bit about Eve. Uh, I know her favorite sports team. I know her pet's names. And so I'm going to take a few guesses of what I think Eve's password might be, just in case she set quite a weak password and I could actually brute force my way into her account. And I might try several of these logins, but it doesn't really get me very far. And so I'm going to need, need a more sophisticated approach. So a little bit of research on my favorite hacking forums soon shows me that there's a couple of ways that I could try and compromise Eve's account or her machine. And so I could either use some form of phishing in order to steal her credentials, or I could try and infect her machine somehow. So with this newfound knowledge from the hacking forums, I'm going to do two things. One is I'm going to create uh, a simple phishing site and that is going to be hosted within uh, Google Forms. My company allows me access to Google. This is my own personal Google account. My company doesn't stop me using that and this form is going to be very simple and it's going to pretend to be a Salesforce form. So when the user looks at it it's going to look like this and perhaps they're going to be tricked into entering some details which will be available to me then through the Google Forms mechanism. So I'm just going to copy this URL now, the second thing I'm going to do is not use or attempt to access Eve's account directly. What I'm actually going to do is compromise an intermediary user, and that user is going to be Dave. So I'm going to use my Salesforce chatter to communicate with Dave to deliver the Salesforce phishing page. So here I'm going to share an update within Salesforce, and I'm going to, I'm going to add Dave. There he is, Dave Houston. Um, and I'm just going to say something simple here. I'll just say, uh, check this out, and I'm going to send him the link in the hope that he then tries to use it to what he thinks is sign on to Salesforce. So I'll share that with Dave. Now on Dave's machine, which we can take a look at, he may be working in Salesforce. He has additional privileges, but he doesn't have the, the, the powers that Eve has. And so I'm gonna use his account, but I'm gonna actually still go after Eve as my, my endpoint destination. I can see that Dave has an alert and that's that Someone called Ross has mentioned him in a chatter and has sent him a link to check something out. So he's going to click on that link. And if his security awareness training hasn't really sunk in, then he's going to perhaps try and uh, log into this organization with his credentials. And I'll put in a, a password and he clicks submit. And something went wrong, you know, he could, he could try again to log in and so on. So classic kind of phishing site really uh, for, for Dave at notscope.com. So with this action taken, Dave's role in this attack is, is kind of over because back on my uh, forms here, I can see that I have a response. So I've got Dave's credentials and I've got his password. And I can now use those to log into his Salesforce instance. So I simply need to log out of my Salesforce and log in instead as Dave at notscope.com and we'll sign in. Now, as I said, Dave has additional permissions, but he's not the user I'm ultimately attempting to compromise. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use another, perhaps more sophisticated compromise on Eve in order to steal the data that I want. So I'm going to go into the accounts that I have visibility to from, the, uh, from this console. And we're gonna look at some of the contacts. because Contact information is valuable and perhaps what I want to steal. So. Dave has permissions to see one of Eve's accounts, this Andy Young gentleman. Um, and I can see that within this account, there is some interesting information here, an invoice list, 
which I'm actually going to take. So I'm going to steal that piece of information because I feel that might be valuable for me to know about. So I'm going to download it. I'll save it locally on my machine. But then furthermore, I'm going to delete it. And once deleted, I'm going to replace it. And I'm going to replace it with a malicious file, actually a file that I have built that will hopefully compromise Eve's machine. So I'm gonna leave this file here for her to find, or maybe I'll send her a chatter message to draw her attention to it. But what I want is for her to open that on her machine. So if we go to Eve's computer, here she is. Eve has all the permissions to access all the contacts that actually I'm interested in stealing. And you know, she may happen across Andy Young and she might notice this attachment that wasn't there before and she may take a look at it. There's no preview available, so we'll download it. Now, upon opening this file that's been uh, attached to this, um, this entry, again, Eve is going to be required to ignore some of the things that she should have really learned on her security awareness training because she's going to be enabling content and enabling the macros to run within this, uh, within this file. And when she does that, it's actually going to be compromising her machine. And we can see some command launch within the taskbar, which is obviously an indicator that something funny is going on. Eve's unlikely to notice that. She will continue to use Salesforce and continue to use her machine unawares. But what that compromise has done, what that malware has done, has actually connected Eve's machine to a Slack instance that's owned by me as the malicious actor. So Eve's PC is now a channel within my Slack instance here. And what I can do within this channel is I can issue commands to Eve's machine, such as looking at what files maybe are on her, uh, on her hard drive um, or something more malicious. So I'm gonna use some commands that I have defined here that are gonna ask the malware that's on Eve's machine to perform actions such as creating a screenshot of whatever she's looking at right now. And then furthermore, uploading that screenshot file into a Dropbox account that is under my control. So let me issue that command to do the Dropbox upload. And then I'm going to clean up my presence on the machine just by killing that task that I've launched through the malware. So let me do that. And there we go. Now, as I say, back on Eve's machine, um, she's really not aware of anything happening. The malware is now uh, closed down. It is no longer running but the damage has been done. Because back on my machine, the malicious actors machine, I now have a folder called Eve's PC. And if I look within this folder, I'll see that just now a file was uploaded. And if I view that file, I can see that it is exactly the screenshot I was expecting of Eve's machine. And obviously contains lots of sensitive data here about the contacts within the organization. So you can see there how I've stolen contact information, PII information from Salesforce using a screen grab. I've also downloaded files and obviously could download many other uh, files from within the Salesforce environment using the accounts that I've compromised and gained access to. So let's take a look now at what happens when we use Netscope to protect against this attack. You'll remember the first thing that I did was try and brute force Eve's password by having a few guesses at it. Now, although this couldn't be prevented through Netscope, what it can do is trigger an alert within Netscope. So our behavioral analytics alerting would have triggered on this. We can see here an entry for the three failed login attempts. And if I drill into the alert details, what we can see is the three discrete login attempts that triggered the alert to be generated once they'd been completed. In all cases, you can see that the user carrying out the login attempt is different from the user that's trying to be used to sign into Salesforce with, which would be an immediate uh, red flag for a security analyst that was perhaps looking at this. Now, the second action that I, I took after trying to brute force the password was to perform some reconnaissance. And I went to the hack forum pages to find out how I could learn to compromise a, an account. With Netscope deployed, we can obviously prevent the user from accessing these types of high risk you know, or security risk websites. And that's what we see here, a block policy implemented by Netscope to prevent access to the hack forums. If I was to carry on with my exploit and try and create my phishing page within Google Drive in order to try and steal the credentials of Dave, um, then also Netscope could prevent access to that Netscope could differentiate between the company's instance of Google Drive and the personal instance of Google Drive that I was using to try and set up this phishing site. 
So without access to Google Drive, the user obviously can't create the, the phishing page. But let's assume they could. And here we are on Dave's machine where he enters the credentials into that Google form. And there's another opportunity here for Netscope to recognize that something is going on that perhaps shouldn't be. And that is when the password and user credentials are submitted into this form, Netscope can actually detect the presence of the company email address. And as the pop-up is showing here, we can generate the security alert that blocks that submission. And it means that uh, the credentials entered by Dave wouldn't actually be submitted into the Google form. So the next stage of the attack, had it been successful, was to use Dave's credentials to sign into Salesforce. So let's go ahead uh, and do that. Um, when we perform this action, once again, we're probably going to generate an anomaly within the user's behavior that will be picked up by Netscope. So if I look in my instance and anomalies at shared credential anomalies, what I'm gonna see in here is a, a graphical representation of both Ross and Dave having used Dave credentials to sign into Salesforce. So once again, this would be a red flag to um, a security team member that there was something going on here that different users were using the same credentials and this could indicate a security incident. So what I did next once I had gained access into Dave's account uh, was I actually went in and deleted after downloading uh, one of the files attached to the contact in Salesforce. Now this action of saving locally and then deleting the file would have also triggered an anomaly within Netscope because I had actually set up a custom rule-based policy under behavioral analytics to detect the very action that I performed. So download and delete would trigger a critical alert uh, if it was seen actioned against Salesforce. And that means if I look in my incidents and behavioral analytics, what I can see in here is that Sure enough, there's an instant description that matches the one that I created um, and it's labeled against the acting user, which was myself. And here are again are the instants that triggered it. So key here is the download and then the delete, raising an alert at a critical level. So that wouldn't have stopped my actions within Salesforce, but again, it raises an alert within the security team to perhaps investigate. Now the next action I took within the portal was I replaced that file with a malicious file. So I uploaded uh, a malicious Excel file with those macros in it. Now, of course, Netscope, if it was enabled, would be inspecting any files uploaded and could detect the malware if it was known within that file and it would be blocked, as which is what we're seeing here with this uh, advanced threat protection pop-up coming up. Um, the opposite is, is obviously true. If I were to have been able to upload that file here on Eve's machine, when she attempted to download the attachment, which obviously is the same attachment, would be malicious, then she would receive the notice to say that she's not able to download it because it contains malware. So Netscope sees both upload and download and can protect uh, against a malicious file. Now, if we somehow managed to get through all the protections so far and got to the stage where Eve was actually going to open up the malicious Excel file and run the macros contained within, then the first thing that this malware does is call home to the Slack instance, if you remember. Now, if we are controlling access to Slack instances that don't belong to our company, then once again, as this malware initiates and tries to call into Slack, you can see this kind of unattended or not user generated event creating another block preventing the malware from actually registering with, with Slack and, and that command and control process beginning. Finally then, for the exfiltration of data, here we are within our Slack command and control. If we had been successful in getting this far and we'd created our screenshot locally on the machine, we now want to enter our Dropbox command to upload it into a Dropbox account. When we issue that command, which I've just done, what we'll see on Eve's machine is that a data protection pop-up once again launches from Netscope saying that somebody's trying to upload file to an unmanaged cloud application. So the actual upload taking place is triggering the policy in this case. So what you've seen there is Netscope protecting a user against a fairly sophisticated malicious insider threat and attack. Obviously, we would hope that that attack would be thwarted at the very first step, but Netscope can provide protections all the way through that kill chain if necessary. The policies used throughout the demonstration have been inline policies, so policies within the next generation secure web gateway. 
And these can be set up very simply, but provide the powerful protection that we've demonstrated today.